Hi everyone, how are you doing? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this is the, uh, one of the important uh, parts of your musical careers, and it's releasing your music. Now we'll be talking about the promotional aspect of that um, later on, but the first challenge is really to get your music out there. Now we've split this into two. Um, first off, Scott's gonna tell us a little bit about how things were and to an extent still good are. Good old days. Um, in, the, in the good old days. And um, that loss, but that's still relevant to today. So things like pressing up CDs. Um, then Stuart's gonna take over and he's gonna give you uh, an overview of how to get your music into all the digital platforms. So that's uh, the best known ones are obviously things like iTunes, um, the Amazon, Spotify, Deezer, but basically what Scott's company does, sorry, Stuart's company does, is get your music into every digital platform that there is. So you could be getting, uh, selling downloads in a store in South Korea. Um, it will all go, it'll all be done through Emu Band. So he's gonna talk you through the process of that. And then afterwards, we'll have both of them answering your questions. Let's start with uh, Scott, who is gonna give us an insight into what a label does and um, what you can do as, a, as your own label these days as well. Thanks, Olaf. Right, well, I think we should start with me learning how to work this. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> That's me <laughs> with no hair. <laughs> and basically, I'll bring this, this slide up because I was once told by a lawyer that a record label's sole function is to create and sell records, which in an ideal world would be great if you could just concentrate on selling records. The reality these days is that you get involved with so much more than just uh, creating the records. But uh, what will a record company do for me? Well, basically, the point of a record company was that you obviously didn't have the money to go into a studio to pay uh, a fancy producer, you know, artwork, rehearsals, and advance to survive on while you were being creative, you know, videos, instruments, gas bill. I have paid artists gas bills before, that's true. Um, and then obviously, following on from that, promotion. Uh, but obviously, the important thing to remember is that you are actually paying for that. The artist is actually paying for that, and that comes out of your royalties, which uh, on a major label tended to be 10 to 15 percent of the of the the retail, not the retail, the uh, the dealer price of the record, which on average maybe five pounds. So about 50, a rough guide is about 50 pence a record, which isn't a fortune, obviously, and especially if that record company spent a million pounds promoting you. Uh, it's quite difficult to recoup that. So basically, they have a failure rate. It used to be about 95% a few years ago. It probably still is. So basically, they'll sign on average, say a big label in the States might sign 100 bands a year. They might spend a million dollars on each of those bands. The average record sales would be 7,000 copies. So they would drop, at the end of that year, they would drop 95 of those bands, which is, you know, pretty, pretty uh, dismal success rate for the bands, obviously. Whereas um, on an indie label, um, they have obviously a lot less money to spend, a lot less power, but uh, you are in exchange getting a much better deal. An indie label, uh, they might not even you know, own the recordings, they'll just license the recordings from you. So if you are a bedroom producer and you're producing dance music or something like that, they'll come to you and say, well, we'll license your recordings for a couple of years, two or three years, uh, and try and make money off them that way, uh, as opposed to actually paying or buying the recordings off you. And then they might do a common split these days is just 50-50 after costs. So um, you, you know, it's as simple as that. And that way, you know, instead of having this, this giant um, uh, contract, which nobody really understands, uh, you have this, this basic deal, which everybody understands. And, uh, you know, the, there's a level of transparency, which is every, everyone is happier with. Does everyone know what a major label is or the difference between a major and an independent? 
Think, what the defi- yeah, the, the definition tends to be, you know, one of the, the three or four major labels, depending on who swallowed up who at the, at the, at the minute. EMI has just been swallowed up. Uh, and an indie label, the definition is basically anyone who isn't part of or funded by those, those major labels. So you've got, what have you got left? You've got Sony left, you've got Warner left, and yeah. Universal. Yeah, basically, yeah. So those three then own lots of um, labels that you'll be familiar with, say Island Records, uh, that's owned by Universal. So they have these what are called imprints, but it is all part of these giant companies that have representation in every single country. Um, With the indie labels, they very much based in um, maybe whole of Europe, if they're one of the larger ones, uh, the whole of the States or North America, but very often they'll do deals with other independent labels in other countries who will represent them there. Yeah, an indie label, I mean, as an indie label myself, I'm looking to sign a band and then ideally I'm looking to then license that on to other indie labels around the planet and that's how we get global distribution, that's you know how we get the, how we get the record out there and for the band, obviously, that, that works out a lot better as well because th- at the end of the day, they get a lot more money. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of complicated things that a major label would do in the old days where they would do things like sub-license, you know, like Virgin uh, Britain would sub-license to Virgin America and then the percentage, by the time your album's gone all the way around the world, you're getting about half a percent of that album, if you know what I mean. There's little things like that that, you know, are, are tied up in these complicated contracts that you wouldn't have being on an indie contract, which can be is literally two pages long. I've done deals with American labels. You do also, it has to be said that you do get some very dodgy indie labels as well. So not Scots, obviously. Cherry Red, to name one. Some of them them do actually do terrible deals that are even worse than the uh, major deals. So just uh, make sure whatever you do before doing a deal, take it to a lawyer and not a lawyer that's used to selling houses or... Usually nice people. I've even written it on that. Uh huh. Because obviously, if you've got an indie label, you're an enthusiast because you're not making much money. You're doing it for the love. But never sign anything and without getting advice. From a music lawyer. Yeah, not from your mum. <laughs> and then we move on to. Your a music lawyer. <laughs> Unless she is, she could be a. Uh, and obviously, you, as we were talking about, self releasing, which is. Um, as easy as, you know, you can record a piece of music in your room, uh, burn it onto some CDs and sell it at your gigs. I mean, it's as easy, and you can call yourself a label, it's as easy as that. Um, physically, getting physical distribution is actually quite difficult these days. So we were talking about that the other day. Uh, <laughs> it used to be a big deal to be on places like iTunes and stuff before things like EMU bands came along and bands would say, oh, I managed to get on iTunes and that was quite a big deal. But these days, that's actually quite easy and it, it, it's the opposite in that getting physical distributions for your CDs and getting those CDs into shops around the country, around the world, that's the tricky part because it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing in that if you're not selling physical CDs, distributors aren't that interested. You know, In the old days, uh, when I pressed up CDs, they went straight from the pressing plant to the distributor. Nowadays, they come to me and then the distributor tells me how many they need on a maybe a monthly basis because the distributors are so small and they've all been gobbling each other up that they, they don't even want to pay for storage. So you're paying for storage effectively and things like that. And there's fewer record shops as well. Much. I mean, there used to be, I think when I started, I started KFM about 13 years ago and there was, I don't know, three or 400 indie shops in Britain and there's less than 50 now that the uh, Shellshock, our distributor, will deal with. So... Um, but that's not to put down the CD. I think the CD's in a bit of a lull. I think it will come back because it's still a very useful format to keep music on. It's a very useful format uh, as a label for, f- you know, for promotion, for getting it out there. You know, um, and it's certainly not a waste of time to press up a you know, thousand CDs is, 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 a, is an all right amount because you, you still have the, out, the outlet of um, selling those online on your online stores and Bandcamp stores uh, at gigs. Because one of the things I've noticed, even in the last couple of years with bands, I mean, we can do a, a gig and it can be four to six hundred and we'll sell, that band will sell a hundred CDs, which is a lot of CDs for a 400 capacity gig. But the reason they're buying them is because the, the customers, they can't, they're not, the indie shops don't exist. So the only place they can get the CD is at the gig. So it's certainly not a waste of, a, a waste of time to do some CDs. And 
it actually looks good because it looks like you're taking it seriously. You're, you know, you're investing a bit of money in what you do. And uh, people like an artifact. People who support the band, they like an artifact from the band. The other point worth making is the, the fact that there aren't very many record shops left has changed the situation now as well because it means that if you take an afternoon, you can go and visit every single record shop in Edinburgh. And if your music's the type of music that they sell, you can give them some CDs to sell on your behalf. And if a record shop's behind you, it's really worth uh, keeping in mind that they can sell hundreds of, still sell hundreds of your um, CDs. And that's, uh, that's something that still goes on. Just make sure that you get the money off them on a regular basis because if they're... Yeah, don't leave it too long because they tend to forget. Yes. How many did you give us? <laughs> um, now, that's the, that's the CD. How much would it cost to get them um, pressed up? Well, pressing, I mean, the pressing plant that I'm using at the minute is, well, the, the agent is a company called Breed. Uh, it's just as simple as that, B-R-E-E-D. And they are very competitive in price. Um, they're as cheap as any company I've ever used, but they are quite a new company, and they're, they're just the, the service is tremendous. You know, they'll, they keep you updated uh, all the way along at the, uh, on every stage, and they're very helpful because, you know, pressing up a CD is probably quite daunting at first, but as a company, they, they will help you out all the way along, and they'll help you out with things like barcodes and, and catalog numbers and, and anything you might ask about ISRC codes, any little thing that you come across that you think, well, what's that? They'll, they're quite happy to help you with. And uh, price-wise, I mean, a thousand CDs, proper pressed up, as we call glass mastered CDs that are pressed up, they'll do from 450 to 550 just for, that's in a normal jewel case. Prices start getting much more expensive if you start getting fancy. As soon as you start adding anything that's you know, out of the ordinary, it can get as expensive as you like. I mean, I've got CDs there that were, that were five pound a unit to produce instead of 50p a unit to produce. <laughs> That's not really sensible record company management, but you know, the band wanted it, so I'm a sucker. All the way up to, uh, you know, vinyl is still a lovely thing to do. Um, you can do as little as a couple of hundred. I get that's kind of expensive because you're going to still spend a thousand pounds on a couple of hundred. It's actually the artwork, it's the covers that cost. The discs aren't too expensive on their own, but the artwork uh, is expensive. But again, it's, it's kind of a lost leader because it's, uh, it looks good that you've got a nice piece of vinyl, even so on the wall. When you say uh, £1,000 for 200 is that 12-inch or is it a 7-inch? That's a 12-inch. So that's an album, basically, and a nice cover. You'd be looking at about £1,000. Uh, all the way up to, again, I've got the, the Mammal album there with £7 a unit, I believe. <laughs> What's that all about? But that's embossed and, and, uh, and everything. But uh, again, it was, it was a, a nice thing to do now and again. Not all the time. And what about sleeve art? Do you have any examples of that have? with you? Hang on. There we go. Nice artwork. Always helps to sell um, a record. But don't forget your barcode and catalog number. Because this record is a nice album cover, but unfortunately I got the wrong barcode and forgot the, the catalog number on the artwork, which meant that when they go to the distributor, they have to be stickered with the right barcode. <laughs> But again, that's a good example of, you know, of being helped. They didn't just send them back and say, we can't use them, you have to repress them. You know, they're very helpful in, in doing that. But that's a, a mistake that I've made that I'm sure a lot of, or hope other people have made. Yeah, I think Stuart's going to cover some of that with the, the different codes in the, the next bit. But are yeah. there, you mentioned mistakes, and I think this is very often with these uh, sessions, we tell people all the the correct stuff to do, but I think of equal importance sometimes is to tell people what the classic mistakes are and how to avoid making those. So what, what would you say are the biggest two mistakes you've made, Scott? Uh, not proofreading art work properly. Yeah, I'm not very good at that. I've done that in the old days, before digital, which wasn't that long ago actually, only a few years that you could do it all digitally. You used to actually have to get films shot for the, for the physical printing of the, of the album artwork. And if you made a mistake on that, you know, it was about 500 pounds for the set of films. So it was, you'd have to literally spend another 500 pounds on a set of films. And uh, I've made that mistake a few times, for sure. Um, but also, 
Don't forget to join the PPL. <laughs> How many of you know what PPL is? Okay, that's impressive. That's uh, good. It's How many understand it, though? <laughs> right. That's very impressive. <laughs> There's, this is something that um, we should... Uh, we should try and sum up as quickly as possible, but if you go to the PPL website, we'll, what we'll do is we'll upload a whole load of uh, different things that we've covered today um, for, you to, uh, for you to check out. PPL, they, um, they administer the sound recordings, the copyright of the sound recordings. So there's two copyrights. One copyright is for the songwriter, so that's through PRS. So wherever that gets played, the songwriter gets royalty. So even if someone covers your song, the PRS will uh, pay you for it, not the person that covered it. PPL, they, they, will, they will license the sound recording. So what happens is that if you do a cover version, but you've performed on that recording, wherever that particular recording is played, and a uh, business is a PPL member, or licensee, say a, it could be anything from a hairdresser to a, a huge venue, you will receive you will receive a royalty for that. So um, basically, if even if you're just a session musician, you should make sure that you're. Yeah, that's kind of the point of it as yes. a musician. I mean, the PPL collect for the person who owns the mechanical copyright, which is usually the record label, and anyone who performs on the record who isn't uh, receiving. Writing royalties through the PRS. So if you are releasing your own records, it's kind of a double whammy because you get the mechanical version and you get the and you get the the performance version as well. So uh, it's just something that people, you know, the PPL themselves aren't particularly great at keeping track of it all, and it's something that is, is worth keeping up. I mean, yesterday, literally yesterday, I found I was uh, I've been working with the PPL this week for this record, but uh, we found five thousand pounds of money that was due to Magic Drive, which is a record I put out over 10 years ago. And that money's been languishing in the PPL coffers. And, uh, and it wasn't until they, I, I, they actually searched for it that they came back and found out. Oh, so we found 5,000 pounds. I went, brilliant, thanks for that. Which was, that was performance, that was for the, that was for the band. So that's the, the, the four members of the band will get a nice Christmas bonus. But this is, a, this is, this is even worse, you thought that was quite bad. This is, um, a record that I'm putting out this month uh, by a guy called Stuart Nisbet, and uh, who was in the Proclaimers for 12 years. Uh, but he um, is a member of the PPL, but has never kept up with it. So he was played on 140 odd Proclaimers tracks, but was only listed on about four of them. So he has potentially lost hundreds of thousands of pounds because it only backdates six years. So as of yesterday, he is now registered for all those tracks and he will get a payment but it will not be a hundred and thousand pounds, which he has basically lost. So there's a, that's a, an, an example of why you need to keep on top of these things because in a time when your revenue streams are not record sales, it is things like performance royalties and stuff. So it's, it's important to get it right. And also just a, another footnote to this, PPL also collect for videos. So that's if, the VPL. Yeah, it's all become part of PPL now though. Check it out because he's made lots of money by making videos. Yeah, definitely. It's worth making videos. Definitely worth making videos. Because uh, if nothing else, um, it's actually easier, I would have to say, to get on MTV than it is to get on the radio. Vic will help me with that later. I've had much more success at getting videos on MTV than I have records getting on the radio. Which I, I, I believe is because they have a lot more airtime to fill and the less people make decent videos. But videos, you know, I've, uh, you can get one, one video play, it was an Asti P video last year, I got £430 in VPL for one play. Uh, and MTV in Britain, it isn't a lot of money, but what they syndicate around the whole thing, so it adds up. So that's an example again of, of trying to make some money. Okay, so I think that we should move on to uh, Stuart's presentation here, because We've talked, uh, talked quite a lot about physical, physical releases, but one of the, the great things about having a digital release is that you can not only see where people are buying your music, you can often get information that's 
even more detailed. And I think that that's something that's really useful if you're planning a tour, if you're going to, if you want it to play abroad, you're thinking of playing abroad, if you've got uh, music out or someone picks up on your music in, a, in another country or in a particular area, you can use this, the, the digital information um, in the same way that you might, if you've had a look at Facebook analytics, you can see who's, get a breakdown of who your friends are on Facebook, um, where they live, um, where they, how old they are, if they've, if they've entered that information. And I think that this is something that, um, one of the reasons that it's very, very important that you, your music is, is released uh, digitally as well as, as well as being released physically. So um, I think, do you need to swap sides there so we can, uh, can extend, your, extend your reach? <laughs> so uh, Stuart, take it away. Yeah, so the, the, the first thing that I'll kind of start off by saying is that I'm really going to try and cram quite a lot of information. So I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you, some stuff that you maybe will be familiar with, some stuff that you won't be. Um, first thing is we myself and Paul will be outside um, for, the, for the rest of the day so come and speak to us if there's anything that we can rattle through um, in the next 10-15 minutes that you're not sure about that you don't want to ask afterwards come and speak to us at all and be more than happy to, to chat through any of it um, as Olaf also touched on um, we are giving everyone a, a free release voucher which will entail you to um, be able to distribute a single free of charge um, through ourselves um, so if you haven't already got one then come and grab one of those from us as well um, so what I'm going to hopefully, if I do my job properly, is over the next 10 minutes, just answer this in practical terms, is just how do you get your music onto these digital services? Um, so we're going to, the first slide is going to look like a hell of a lot of information all chucked at you to begin with. Um, what we're going to do is just going to go through this, and I just wanted to provide really just in one slide, really just provide an overview of the, the full process. Um, so if there's one slide that you need to refer back to to kind of get your head around it, and just to start off with, um, which is to go with this one. Um, so if we look at the, the, the top, first of all, got down as being the, the artist or label, and the three fundamental core elements that we need from any artist or label in order to distribute a release is the, the data itself, the audio, and the artwork for the release. Those are the three things, and we're going to go, I'll touch on those three things in a little bit more detail in, in, in the next couple of slides. So we're going to go down the, the, the left-hand side first of all. So the artist or label is going to get everything to ourselves in the middle. They're going to give us all the data, they're going to give us the audio, and they're going to give us the artwork for the release. Now they're going to give us, I should also say that I'm going to talk through this from our perspective. The deals and things are going to be different depending on the distributor, but the, the information that you need to supply and what you actually need to supply is going to be pretty much the same, whatever distributor it is that, that you're using. Um, so with ourselves, you're going to supply all of that to us, and you're also going to give us what's called a non-exclusive license to distribute your music. Now, basically what that means is that there's no fixed term. You're not tying yourselves into anything. The non-exclusive part means that you're free to use other distributors. If there's a store, for example, that we, for whatever reason, didn't distribute to, and you wanted to use another distributor to, to cover that store, you'd be free to do so. You're, you're not tied to us in any way. It also means that you maintain 100% of, of your rights at all times. You're not, you're not giving us any rights to your music. You're just giving us permission to distribute on your behalf. What we are then going to do is, once you've given us all your data, your audio, and your artwork for the release, we're then going to what's called sub-license that on to the different retailers. So you're going to tell us which stores you want your music onto, and we will then, through our agreements with these stores, sub-license your release to be at iTunes, be at Amazon, be at Spotify as, as examples. So your release is then live on store, we just we distribute it out, it, go, it goes live on store, somebody goes on to iTunes, purchases the download, somebody goes on to Spotify, st streams your track, Back up the right-hand side is, is, is where the money's going to come. So one of the most important parts, parts to you guys as um, musicians releasing music. So the store or the retailer is going to pay the royalty back to ourselves, and we're then going to pay 100% of what the stores pass to ourselves straight back to you as an artist or a label. Um, so what that essentially means is that we are not taking any percentage of what the store give to us. Um, so you're going to be, be getting 100% of that. Um, 
So, as I say, what one slide, kind of quick overview of the full process. What I'm going to try and do now is just, without getting too bogged down in it, just go through the data, the audio, and the artwork in a little bit more detail. Um, before I jump onto that, the first thing you're going to need to do, and as I say, this is the same for whether you're doing it through any distributor, you're going to need to have an account with them. Um, with ourselves, it's a very, very straightforward registration process that you, exactly similar to if you're creating a Twitter account or a Facebook account, you're just going to set up your username, your login details, etc. give us your contact details. So that would be the first step. And then once you have done that and you've logged into your account, you're just going to click the option to, to add a new release. Um, and what the next two slides are going to be, and as I say, if I do this properly, what I'm hoping to demonstrate is that you may have heard people talk about metadata for your release previously. Um, and in my opinion, it's quite often made out to be this big, scary, complicated set of data um, that, that you're, you're going to struggle to understand. What I'm hoping to demonstrate in these two slides um, is that it's really, really straightforward information. And 99% of the information that you're going to need to give us is stuff that you're already automatically going to know. Um, it's just about understanding what it is that, that be it ourselves or another distributor is actually asking for. So, the first set of information you're going to give us is the information that's going to relate to the full product. Um, so, for example, the release title of the track. Everyone's going to, or the release title, sorry, for the release. So you're going to know what you want your release to be called. Very, very straightforward. The number of tracks that are on that release. Again, you're going to know the number of tracks that, that are on your release. The first part that's maybe going to be up there that you're not too sure about is, is the UPC. So UPC stands for a unique product code. Um, and that is basically the numerical part to a barcode. So if you were to go to the shop and buy a pint of milk, for example, you look at the barcode, you've got the bit that they scan, and there's then got the, the digits underneath. For digital purposes, there's, no, there's nothing that, that's getting scanned, so it doesn't need the, the graphical image. What they do use, though, is, is the, as, as a numerical part. Um, and that's basically just used as a unique identifier. So every, every release will have a unique barcode assigned to it. Um, and that's used so that stores can accurately track sales and report sales back to you. So it basically means that you're going to get the money that you're due. Um, we can, if, um, if you need us to assign a barcode for you, so if you don't already have one in place, then we can do that free of charge. Um, so with ourselves, you just leave that field blank and we'll look after that for you. Um, alternatively, um, there we, you can go through the, the Barcode and Standards Agency in the UK is a, an organization called GS1. Um, so you can go through GS1 and pay for, pay for your barcode. Can, if you generate this barcode, can they also use that on a physical release? You can't. You would unfortunately need to use a different one. Um, we are only able to assign UPCs for products that we'll actually be distributing. So because we wouldn't be distributing the physical format of your release, if you needed a barcode for the, for the physical version, um, you can go to GS1 and get what's called a single-use license. Um, they, they, they do work with, with musicians individually, um, so you can go ahead and get that from them. Um, the next part on there is the release date. So that's basically, that's, that's entirely at your own discretion. That's, that's you telling us what you want us to tell stores when you want your release to come out. Um, the P year sounds, you may not be familiar with what it means. I've included this in the, the right-hand side. There's a very, very basic definition. Um, and that's basically the copyright in the entire product. Um, so it's generally going to be the, 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 the first, um, the, the initial year of release. Um, for that version of, of that release. So if it's the first time that you're putting, putting an album out or an EP out, that's going to be the, the, the current year. Um, the C year is, is represents the copyright and the sound recordings. Again, a lot of the time that's, um, that's going to be the current year and it's going to be the, the year that the recordings were first released. Um, and the final bit of product information you're going to need to give us is what genre. So again, you're going to know what genre you want your music classified in and you just give us that. Um, the next Kind of a lot of information you're going to give us is the information that's going to refer to your actual track. So, starts off very, very basic. The title of the track. Now, this is the information you're going to provide for each of your tracks. So if you had three tracks on your release, you're going to provide this information for, for all three. So, as I say, title of the track, you're all going to know. Duration of the track, you're all going to know. Um, the C year, um, 
is, is the exact same um, as, as we touched on previously. So it's the, the year of release for, for that um, individual recording. Um, the composer um, is going to be who originally wrote the musical composition for that track. So I've put myself down. If I, if I was uh, just writing it all on my own, um, it could go down as myself. You could also put that down as your entire band if you wanted to credit the full band. It's basically your, that's who the songwriter is. Um, so that's something that you would agree between yourselves as a band or as a, as a musician before you give that information to us. Um, explicit lyrics is a basic yes or no, um, pretty straightforward. The only thing I would touch on there is that explicit lyrics doesn't just refer to swearing, really anything that could be generally deemed as being offensive. Um, my advice would be if you're not sure, speak to us or err on the side of caution and mark it as explicit. Um, Do you ever get people selling more because it's explicit? Uh, probably the opposite. Probably um, people being wary of marking things as explicit um, for fear that it's going to put things off or people assuming that it doesn't have any swearing but are perhaps being quite controversial and be quite offensive in, in lyrics, but because it doesn't have any swearing in it, then they think that's it's, it's not explicit. And as I say, it's best it's best to err on the side of caution on that. Um, publisher um, again is perhaps something that you 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 wouldn't be too sure on. Um, if you are if you haven't assigned if you basically if you're a, if you're an artist or you're a band and you haven't signed a publishing deal, then that's just going to default to copyright control, and that basically means that you still own all of the the, the publishing rights that those haven't been you haven't assigned those on to anyone else. If you had signed a publishing deal, then you just enter the publishing company's name in there. Otherwise, um, you're just going to leave that as copyright control, which is which is what it would default to. Um, the ISRC is is another one. Um, that, that, that was kind of touched on earlier on. Um, the easiest way that I think to describe an ISRC code, which is an international standard recording code, um, is think of it as being a barcode for individual recordings. Um, it's a unique identifier that's assigned onto the recording, so not the composition assigned onto the recording. Um, and again, it's used pretty much in exactly the same way as a barcode is, is that it's used so that stores, if somebody goes on to iTunes, for example, and purchases track six off of your release. They need to be able to give us an identifier back for that release in order to say, right, this sold on this date in this territory, there's the royalty for it. And the ISRC is the common denominator of, an, of a, a unique identifier for that. Um, likewise with UPCs, we can assign them free of charge for any tracks, or you can register with PPL. Um, PPL will then give you a unique registrant code um, which is the third, fourth, and fifth digits in there, the one that I've just populated as being EMU. Um, they would give you a registrant code, um, which would then enable you to assign your own ISRCs, in which case you, just, you would fill those in um, as, as you've assigned them. Um, and the little bit that's been cut off there just at the bottom is, again, you just give us a genre for each of the tracks. So again, is, is information that you're already going to have in place. Um, so those two slides cover all of the product information that you're going to need to give us and all the track information that you're going to need to give us. So there's really nothing too complicated in there. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing that's going to, going to trip you up. Um, it hopefully, can I give you a brief overview of, of all of that? So that would simply be referred to as the metadata that yeah. what you've just showed. Yeah. And that's the, all that information is what we'll take from you and pass, pass on to stores. That's all the information that describes your release um, and enables that to be sold digitally and, and reported back accurately. Um, excuse the kind of funny format and that kind of, kind of went on there as well. Um, the next thing, so right at, right at the very beginning, the first slide we looked at, there was three component pieces that we needed from you. There was the data, which we've just went through. Um, the next part is the, the audio. Um, the audio itself, um, we're going to ask for it in WAV format. Um, now, I've included more specifications up there. Um, if you're not too au okay with any of those, don't worry about that. Any studio that you're in, wherever you're recording, if you let them know that that's the specs you need it, and they'll be able to get it as very, very standard, straightforward specifications that we need. You can also convert to that 
using basic iTunes, the, the iTunes software as well that, that many of you may have on, on your computer, you can convert to this as well. Um, if you do have any problems, then we are on hand to help out as well. Um, the reason that we ask for WAV format is that we then need to, stores are going to look for your audio in a variety of different formats. So what we'll do is we'll take your high quality WAV and then encode that into the different formats that each store might require. So for example, iTunes will want an audio in one format, Spotify will want an audio in another format, Amazon will want it in another format times that by the hundreds of stores that we distribute to, that all of a sudden becomes quite a big job. So what we do is we simplify that and we just say, look, give us one uncompressed audio file and then we'll look after making sure that, that it all meets the required specifications for each of the individual stores. Um, note on there down the bottom, we can, we can use MP3s. Um, we wouldn't recommend them just because of, of the lower quality. Um, but, if, if, but if you do want us to use them, then, then we can do that. And the final of the three things is the artwork for the release. Um, again, a very, very straightforward set of specifications. Don't get too bogged down if there's any of these kind of terms that you're, you're unfamiliar with. Whoever it is that's designing your artwork will be more than familiar with this as, as, as really standard specs for, for these guys. Um, or, or we'll be on hand to kind of help you out as well. Um, so it's a JPEG um, that, that we need um, 1600 by 1600 pixels, which is the width and the height um, of, the, of the image itself. Um, the 300 DPI just refers to the resolution, so it means that you're going to give us a nice high quality um, image for, for use on stores. Um, and the RGB color mode basically just means that it's, um, you get you get a couple of different types of color modes and RGB is the, the, the standard one that the majority of stores will, will require. A um, couple of quick additional considerations, it does need to be square, um, stores all need a square artwork. The, the actual size will vary but like the, the audio we'll we make sure that it goes into the right specs from there. Um, Black and white images still need to be in RGB color mode. Um, shouldn't contain any additional text or information. Um, by that, I mean don't try putting your phone number on your artwork. Don't put your email address on your artwork. Um, don't try giving us a Beatles cover art or something for, for your release. Don't put a different band name, etc. cetera. Um, stuff that you're, not gonna, you're generally not going to do anyway, but sometimes does, it does, does need um, put across. Um, and the, the artist and album title should match exactly with your release data. Um, again, stuff that the, the majority of you are, are going to do anyway, just, just as a matter of course. Um, very, very quick couple of, kind of key questions and most of the frequent ones that, that we asked. Um, how much about the cost? I'm just going to cover this from, from our point of view. Um, we just had a, a strictly one-time distribution fee, so we don't have any, any annual or, or renewal fees. Um, the class of single has been um, one and two tracks, an EP is three to five, and an album is anything from six to 20. Um, do you keep all of your rights? Yes, you do. Um, as we touched on earlier on, it's just a non-exclusive license. You're always in control of all the rights um, at all times. Um, you can come out of the, the agreement, you can tell us to take the release down at any point. Um, we don't take a percentage of any of the royalties, so exactly what iTunes or whoever, what any other retailers pass back to us is exactly what we're going to pass back to yourself. Um, the one that's been chopped off down the bottom is probably one of the most common ones and that how long does it take? Um, that will vary from store to store. Um, at the moment, we see the majority of releases live on iTunes within 24, 48 hours once we've got everything through from you. Um, the majority of all our stores we would generally recommend allowing between 10 to 14 days. Um, the only point I'd make on that is that that is the, that, that's the, the turnaround for the release. So that's just the processing of the release in terms of actually getting it live. As we'll maybe touch on kind of later on in the, the promotion part of it is that if you're actually planning a, a, a promotional campaign around the release, we would advise you allow more, more time than that. But that's the basic turnaround time for, for getting content live on stores. Um, and the final thing I wanted just to, to kind of highlight was there's a lot of information that I've not covered kind of in here. Um, we do have a whole section on our website which is full of different blogs that we've put together and um, that's going to cover a variety of different subjects. So be that if you're looking to tour, we've, sp we've spoken to people on that, how to, uh, to get um, music on radio, um, 
very, very different subjects. So to do check out, if you, if you jump onto our website, just on, on the right hand side of all the pages, you'll see a, a click here link um, to view any help and advice blogs. Um, so if there's anything that we've not covered here that you're interested in, then, then definitely check it out. And that's us. That's everything from me. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. I'm um, impressed how you managed to squeeze yes, so much in, but I, I knew you'd be able to do it. Um, the, I guess one of the, the questions that immediately springs to mind is once uh, people have bought, hopefully bought the music, um, how long does it take for them to get paid for it? Different, different stores um, from... I can certainly kind of cover the, the digital side of it. D different stores will report different periods. Some will do monthly, some will do quarterly. Um, and the reports generally come in four to six weeks after the end of each period. So either after four to six weeks after the end of each month or four to six weeks after the end of each quarter. So as soon as we've received the report and we've received the payment, we will then straight away make that available to yourselves. Um, with us, you, would, you can view the information online or you can download the information to get, to get a full breakdown. But four to six weeks either, either after the month or after the quarter. Scott, you've, uh, you're obviously familiar with the, the income that comes from both distributed CD sales and or physical sales and also uh, online sales. I mean, what, what would someone expect to get now if they were selling a, an album in a shop like FOP? Um, it all depends on what dealer price you want to have. You know, if you, if you want the, the shop to stock more CDs, they'll probably stock more if you give them a better dealer price. So if you said, well, four pounds, and then you can, they, they'll sell it at whatever they want to sell it at, you know. So they might still put that record at 11 pound 50, and they'll, they'll make a lot more money on it, but then they're a lot more likely to stock more of your records. So it's, it's kind of a negotiation um, with, the, with the shop. I mean, average dealer price at the minute is about five pounds. And if you were putting the, if it was your label rather than a major, what, how much of that would go to the artist? Uh, for us, we just do a 50-50 profit share after, well, after all the expenses are covered and stuff. And in terms of the actual sales, uh, digital sales, what would, you know, in your experience, be a, a kind of ballpark figure for iTunes or, or Amazon? Yeah, um, iTunes would be a, a 79 pence track. iTunes, uh, Apple take 30% off the top for selling that. And then our digital distributor would take, uh, our distributor takes 20% off that. So 79 pence download ends up at 44 pence, I believe. Back right. to KFM. So I, if you were doing it, I mean, without giving an exact figure, would pe people be getting a bit more for that? Yeah, quite a bit more. Without yeah. going into exact figures, quite a bit more. You would get yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, that's because you don't have yeah, you don't you don't have an intermediate distributor. Yeah, yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah. But that's the that's the pros and cons because I don't have to pay to get my stuff distributed. If you know what I mean. So it's it's a it's a total balance as to if you you, you could sit and crunch the numbers as to what you think you would make. If you know what I mean. Whether you have because uh, if Shell Shock release a record for me, they're 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 taking the physical, they're doing the digital. Um, obviously, I'm not paying anything up front. Uh, they're doing a lot of press and stuff as well themselves, and they're sub-distributing it throughout the world through other physical distributors. So I'm get letting them do the, the, the digital, and I'm getting slightly less because it's going through another distributor, but that's weighed yeah. against what it's, they bring to the, to the, the party. If you know it's I mean. worthwhile kind of touching on the 30% the without knowing what your kind of distributors do with iTunes would be. There's going to be other costs in that, though there's not just going to be a straight iTunes cut off the top. So you're going to have, um, there's, there's going to be a mechanical deduction on that. There's going to yeah. be financial transaction taken off that. So it's not iTunes taking 30% all for themselves, and that's, that's all their cash. No, but that, that's, just, that's just the that's numbers. That's what you end up But what, what the people want to know is if you sell a track for 79p on iTunes uh, through Shellshock, yeah. SRD, you get 44p back. All the, the minutiae of what happens in between. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, and I guess if you're, you're doing it through Emu Bands because you, what you're doing is you're just putting it out there rather than working on the press, if I'm right in sort of saying this, this sure. was the case, then um, you, will get, you will get more, but you'll have to do more work on, on other areas. So you'd have to look out for 
putting your own physical release. I would say as a kind of ballpark, you'd probably be looking, if you're coming through yourself, you'd probably be looking at getting about 50% more than that back. Are there any, um, are there any digital retailers that are pay well compared to others? I mean, in your experience, are iTunes the best payers or are Amazon, do you get a good cut from Amazon? Are there any the The thing about iTunes is they have the power because they have the they have the, the infrastructure that's out there that most people are using. So if my digital sales are A, um, iTunes, B, YouTube, <laughs> and then everything else follows after that because YouTube uh, pay a royalty and at the minute that's the number one music site in the world. You know, so Al, for example, um, Jeep Solid, for example, um, the crazy Jeep Solid. You know, I, I uh, licensed a track to uh, an American skateboard company called Volcom uh, and it's on their video, and that video's had over a million hits, so that works out about a £1,000 in YouTube royalties, and I haven't sold a £1,000 worth of, of online sales, if you know what I mean. So, so Scott's YouTube's very, very important. Scott's very big on, dig, uh, sorry, on video, and we can go into more detail in this um, in the break or at the end once we've done the the promotion session, but do speak to Scott about video because he has got some good advice on that and he makes lots of money from it. So that's what you want to know. Um, has anyone got any questions? Can we get a mic to the middle here, please, James? Hello, uh, I've got a question about the emu bands, the free voucher sure. thing that you yep. gave us. Um, that's for the single, am I correct? Yes. Yep. Uh, how many tracks does that consist of? The, we, we would class a single just as, single is just our own terminology, just to kind of break it down for ourselves. So it would, that would cover you for one or two tracks. Um, so one or two tracks, or if you've got an EP or if you've got an album, it would give you like the equivalent 24.95 off uh, an EP or an album. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. So, go him for second. Yeah, there's. Yeah. Um, just in in terms of like an artist releasing an album like online, would you think it would make sense to release the entire thing like up on Spotify, like just every song, or maybe just a couple and like leave the rest out so that, like, n not for immediate streaming. So like, there's a set incentive to like buy the full album. Like, what do you think about that? Uh, personally, I would string it out as long as you can, as long as you can get away with um, the releasing singles before you release the album and then releasing singles after the album. You know, basically you want your marketing uh, thing to be as long as possible, really, to give people the best chance. If you just put your whole album up there in one go, um, it's kind of a short event, mm -hmm. basically. So I would string it out personally, but you know, everybody's different. From digi a digital perspective as well, there's a guy called Scott Cohen who set up what's now the largest independent digital, digital music distribution company. It's called The Orchard. And he's done some studies on this where rather than releasing an album, what he did was he got the, one of the acts he managed to release EPs, so three or four tracks, but every few months. And what works with that is that people are more inclined, in, at least based on this study, to buy all three or all four tracks rather than with an album where people are more inclined just to cherry pick a few that they, they like. And the other advantage with that is, is that you can, an EP gives you a chance to make a song and dance about um, your, your music well, every three or four months, however often you want to do one. Whereas an album, you're putting a lot of eggs in one, in one basket. And you can, get a, you can get four or five quid for an EP physically as well at a gig. It's, it's an easier sell, I think, than trying to flog an album for a, for a tenor. Yeah, it's done, and we've done it. I mean, and it's been, been done a lot in the past, the Stone Roses ride. They all, they all use that, of releasing three or four EPs, then the album, which is the collection of the EPs. If you know what I mean, it's been done quite a lot. It does work quite well. Have you got any views on this, Stuart? Um, I mean, we see, because we deal with a, a, a variety of different labels and artists, we can see people try out quite a lot of different things. Um, so we'll see some people that, that will do, as Scott said, and we'll have quite a lot of singles and, and build up to the album. Um, in terms of 
when somebody does go around to doing an album B, do they just go into that or do they do an EP in terms of whether they, they put it on streaming services at the same time as, as other things? We, to be honest, we see it, the vast majority of labels and artists that come through us now distribute to everywhere at the same time with the same release date. Some people will stagger it. So some people will do will maybe have the release available on for, for download for a couple of weeks in advance of doing um, of making it available on streaming services. Some people will do the opposite. Um, and Amazon have just recently started doing um, doing streams, iTunes do pre-release streams as well. Um, there are quite a lot of people who will go and do and make the available the album available for streaming on Spotify as an early release. So there's people doing it in one side, people doing it on the other side, and there's people who just go straight down the middle and will have it available across everywhere on the same release date. Um, my advice would be that you, as a label or as, as, as your artist, is going to know your fan base better than anyone else. Um, and therefore, you're going to best place to know what you think is going to help maximize. Um, we can kind of help and advise. Um, but there's people trying out all sorts of different things, and people get success from, from different ways of doing it. Um, something that uh, like my band have looked at doing, but we're not quite sure how we would go about it, is if for like online downloads um, through iTunes, is to maybe attach like a music video as a free download with, as an incentive to go with the, with the album or, or, or for a certain track. But we're not quite sure how we would go about sure, it. Sure, you any can. Sites that could. You can do what iTunes will term as being mixed media bundles. Um, so that's where you would have like perhaps a video attached onto to three tracks. Um, Setting something up as a free download um, is generally something that, that, that isn't too open, that they're, they're, they're not too... Google Play have started offering um, the ability to set things up for free downloads. iTunes do um, a couple of features. They're a single of the week feature, which is set up as a free download. Apart from that, they don't have too much space for it. Um, but Google Play is an interesting one that I've just kind of recently started. Are you talking doing. about downloading the video or downloading the um, the audio track? Like it, you'd pay for the album, but an incentive yeah. is with the album you would get a, free, uh, a music video which would go onto your your i you know iPad or I, one one way you one way one way you could look at doing it is if you did a mixed media bundle on iTunes, so you had like three tracks and the video. You you do have flexibility on iTunes to to set what you want um, within specific tiers for what you want the pricing to be. So you could just look at what the pricing options are and just not really reflect the fact that there's the, the video so incentivized. So there would still have to be a charge. If somebody wanted to download the video on its own, it would it would cost them. But if they wanted to download the full bundle, which is what you probably want to drive people, to, people towards, then you maybe just look at having a lower bundle price, which incentivizes them to actually purchase the full thing and they get, they get, they get the video in as well. Or you just put it on YouTube and you'll get some royalties on YouTube if you get you, enough. Yeah, you do. I mean, mix, mix Media Bundles are an interesting one. They're a good way to try and kind of add additional content rather than just having a straightforward audio release. Yeah, really. it's just something to try and make it, you know, a yep. bit different, something to make it stand out a bit. Yeah, I mean, other things you can do is, is, is things like digital booklets. You can add, like, PDF digital booklets um, that are made available um, as, like, album-only purchases so it basically means that you couldn't get it on its own but if you purchase the full bundle then that's a nice bit of additional content and it's basically a digital equivalent to to liner notes that you'd have having a physical one now one thing that we've not touched on that i think is important to mention is that if you're just wanting to test some tracks out or really look at um just selling something to a smaller audience without the benefit of having it across all the digital platforms. You can use Bandcamp and people can buy your music from Bandcamp directly. Um, it's probably not something to do in the, the long term, but when you're starting out, that's quite a, an effective thing to, to keep in mind. And you can, st you can have a small biog up there and other bits of information. Um, if you're wanting to just have your music out there for people to listen to where you can send links to journalists, you should also be thinking about SoundCloud as well and obviously YouTube for the, for the video aspect of it. Thanks to the panelists, yeah.